Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. I'm Irina Polanco Ventura, and I am the Director of Public Health Initiatives at the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health. Today's webinar is entitled Postpartum OCD, Making Sense of Scary Thoughts. This is the third talk of our four-part series, which focus on topics related to perinatal mental health. As always, we would like to thank the New Jersey Department of Health for funding these important programs and making it possible for us to bring them to you. The following are just some housekeeping matters. During this presentation, we will be muting all attendees, but please feel free to use the chat box for questions and the speaker will respond to as many as possible at the end of his talk. To receive a certificate of completion, you must listen to the entire webinar and complete the evaluation survey. An hour after the webinar ends, you will receive a link to a post-program evaluation. Please complete the survey to provide us with feedback on the program. Certificates will then be sent via email within one week of the webinar. Also, the recording for this program will be available on the Partnership's website and YouTube channel. Now on to our speaker. Dr. Zachary Infantilino received his bachelor's degree in psychology from the Pennsylvania State University, where he graduated with honors. He received his doctorate in clinical science from the University of Delaware. Dr. Infantilino has received specialized training in exposure and response prevention for obsessive compulsive disorder from the Center for the Treatment and Study of Anxiety at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as from the Behavioral Therapy Training Institute which is a part of the International OCD Foundation. Dr. Infantilino presently works at Stress and Anxiety Services of New Jersey, where he specializes in utilizing evidence-based therapies to treat children, adolescents, and adults diagnosed with OCD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and anxiety disorders. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Infantilino. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'd like, like to welcome you all to the webinar and thank you for taking the time out of your day to attend. Um, I hope that you're all hanging in there with everything that's going on right now. Um, I'd also like to thank the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey for inviting me to speak in this webinar series. Um, I just want to start out with uh, disclosures. So Irina mentioned these. Um, but as far as financial disclosures, I have no financial disclosures to make. Um, you see the approval status does not imply endorsement by the organizations of any commercial products discussed. Um, and to receive the continuing education hours, individuals need to attend the entire webinar. And the webinar will be posted on YouTube and on the website. Um, so if you miss something and you want to go back to it, you'll be able to do that. Or if you find this talk was helpful and want to share it with someone, you'll have that opportunity as well. I just want to start out with a roadmap to give you guys an idea where we'll be going today. So we're going to be starting out with um, some history and a description of OCD so that we're all on the same page. Talk about differential diagnosis. How do we separate OCD from other disorders? Talk about prevalence and how it relates to the postpartum period. And then talking about treatment and then bring it back to questions at the end. So the first evidence of OCD interestingly comes from religious texts rather than medical texts. And it typically fo focuses on a specific form of OCD known as scrupulosity. Um, oftentimes when we hear OCD, we kind of immediately think of that contamination and hand washing combination. Um, but OCD can present in a broad number of ways, which is something we'll come back to throughout the presentation. Um, in the form of scrupulosity OCD, the obsessions are about one's sins and the compulsions are acts of religious devotion, whether that's praying, confession. And so in one of the first known public presentations of what we now call OCD, and this was in 1691, the Bishop of Norwich, John Moore, preached before Queen Mary II on religious melancholy. And so when describing this, he described worshipers who are tormented by naughty and sometimes blasphemous thoughts, despite all of their attempts to stifle and suppress them. He noticed that despite their attempts to stifle and suppress those thoughts, the more they struggle with them and the more that they increase. So this is really a tremendous amount of insight into how OCD works. So this idea that there's these thoughts that come in that cause a lot of distress. And no matter what you do to make them go away or to try to neutralize those thoughts, it often makes the symptoms worse. 
it's helpful to put into context why some of the earliest indications of OCD are related to scrupulosity. So one thing that's important to keep in mind with OCD is that it typically fixates on what is most important to a person. So it makes sense that at this point in time in history, when religion plays a major role in people's lives, examples of OCD take the form of scrupulosity. Again, this is a, something that they hold very dear. It's a major value for them. And the OCD is going to go after and kind of attack that thing that you care about the most. Then in the 1700s and 1800s, physicians started describing more types of behaviors, including washing, checking, obsessive fears about syphilis, aggressive and sexual obsessions, um, and they saw fewer religious obsessions. In the 1800s, French psychiatrists viewed what we now call OCD as a disorder of emotions, in part due to the anxiety that is experienced in OCD and the lack of impulse control. So feeling the strong desire to perform some sort of compulsion or do some action and struggling to, uh, to rein that in. And they categorized it with phobias, panic disorder, agoraphobia, and hypochondriasis. Um, German psychiatrists, on the other hand, viewed it more as a disorder of intellect and categorized it more with paranoia. So focusing on, focusing on the obsession piece, this kind of disconnect with reality at times of those obsessions. And I'll come back to uh, that idea when we talk about this symptom specifically. And around the turn of the 20th century, Pierre Genet thought that individuals lacked sufficient psychological tension. So this gets into the psychodynamic views of OCD. You have Freud talking about defense mechanisms, um, being associated with unconscious conflicts. And then in the 1960s and 70s, you saw more behavioral and cognitive theories of OCD taking hold. And so those are the theories that I'll be talking most about today uh, in this talk. Now in the DSM-5, OCD falls under the obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So just to provide some context, in that group of disorders, you have OCD, body dysmorphic disorder, excoriation or skin picking, hoarding, and trichotillomania or um, hair pulling. And so today I'm gonna to be focusing on obsessive compulsive disorder, but just to give you a framework of where this fits within the DSM. And so I want to start out with the DSM criteria to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, many of you may have experience with the disorder. Those of you that do not probably can come up with an example in your mind. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that OCD comes in a broad set of presentations. And so, you know, we kind of have these, um, these ideas that, that we can quickly grab onto of what OCD looks like. But it's helpful to, to think about the um, the criteria and, and the different types of presentations that it can take. So you have to have the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. And obsessions are defined as the reoccurrent and the persistent thoughts, urges, or images that are experienced at some time during the disturbance as intrusive or unwanted. And that in most individuals, this causes market anxiety or distress. And the individual attempts to ignore or suppress such thoughts, urges, or images, or to neutralize them with some other thought or action. And so the, the main takeaways are the obsessions are unpleasant and people don't want them. They, they do things to make them go away. They try to ignore them. They try to suppress them. For compulsions, those are defined as repetitive behaviors or mental acts that the individual feels driven to perform in response to an obsession or according to rules that must be applied rigidly. In addition, behaviors or mental acts are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress or preventing some dreaded event or situation, although these behaviors or mental acts are not connected in a realistic way to what they are designed to neutralize or prevent or are clearly excessive. Um, it's worth noting if you're working with children, young children may not be able to articulate the goals of those behaviors or mental acts. But the, the, for here, the takeaways are the individual feels driven to engage in these compulsions. And the, the goal of the compulsion is to prevent or reduce that stress or to prevent or reduce some feared outcome. So a couple of examples, right? One is kind of your classic hand washing. So maybe someone has a fear of contracting a disease and they frequently wash their hands. Now, given the situation that we're in right now, a lot of you people may be thinking, well, I do that. That kind of sounds like OCD. Um, and it's really important to differentiate what's OCD 
and uh, what's not OCD. So if you think about the situation that we're in now, most for most of us, our actions are based on facts, whether that is uh, recommendations from the World Health Organization or the CDC, um, or some other authority of there is a danger and we need to take these steps to protect ourselves. So the actions, the hand washing, the precautions we're taking, those are based on facts. If those actions are based purely on anxiety, that's when it starts to look much more like OCD. Um, another example is scrupulosity. I talked about this at the beginning of the, the webinar. Um, an individual may have a fear of committing a sin or offending God. It could be something very slight. I worked with an individual who um, they had a statue of Mary outside. When he walked by the statue of Mary, if he had a bad thought that wasn't considered a sin, could be offending God. And then the compulsions could lead him to frequently go to confession, praying for multiple hours a day, constantly reaffirming in his mind his commitment to God. And so those are just some examples of how OCD can look. And in a, a few slides, I'll talk about it specifically um, as far as postpartum OCD. Um, for the other criteria, we have your standard criteria that the symptoms uh, must be impairing. They are not attributable to a substance or another medication, and the symptoms are better are not better explained by another mental disorder. With OCD, you also have uh, specifiers as far as the insight. So insight can vary across individuals. So someone with good insight, they recognize that the obsessive compulsive disorder beliefs are definitely or probably not true. Um, you can have poor insight where they think that they probably are true. And then you can have individuals where they don't have insight, and this can almost seem like a delusion. So the person is completely convinced that the OCD beliefs are true. And we'll talk in treatment in the treatment section about how to deal with these insight issues, and also uh, in a few slides talking about how do we differentiate uh, delusions in a psychotic disorder from OCD. I wanted to point out comorbidities. So in individuals with OCD, about 41% also are experiencing comorbid depression. About three quarters of them will be experiencing comorbid uh, another anxiety disorder. And about 30% experience comorbid tick disorders. Okay. So now let's look at some of the postpartum obsessions. And so I have a, a list here. I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna take a minute and let you read them and I'm gonna highlight a couple of them. And so it's worth pointing out that obviously these thoughts are really scary. You know, if you are a newborn, a uh, new mother, and you have thoughts of stabbing the newborn baby, or you have disturbing thoughts of sexually abusing the baby, um, or you have this fear of being responsible for giving the child a serious disease, that's going to be really scary. And if you think back to in the history se section where I mentioned how OCD goes after the things that are most important to you. When you're pregnant or a new mother, that fetus or child is likely one of the most important pieces of your life. So it's not a surprise that OCD is going to go after these fears. And here's a list of compulsions. Again, I won't read them. I'll just give you a minute to read them yourselves and I'll highlight a couple. It's worth noting with these that they can take the, pr the form of extra things that someone is doing, so excessive washing or sterilizing of the baby's, baby's bottles, or it can take the form of avoidance, so avoiding changing diapers for fear of sexually abusing the baby or inadvertently touching them in an inappropriate way. I also have another list of compulsions, again, just so you can see the breadth of the forms that it can take. And similar to the hand washing example during COVID that I mentioned, we wanna think again about what's driving those compulsions. Are they being driven by anxiety or are they driven by facts? You know, if you look at the first one of uh, constant checking on the baby, um, it's reasonable that you'll need to check on your baby from time to time. 
Um, but if the reason is purely anxiety, that may be a compulsion. So as a concrete example, if a new mother checked on their baby two minutes ago and then checked again because they had the thought that something might have happened, that sounds like it might be a compulsion. If she heard the baby cry or heard a loud noise, then that thought that something might have happened, that thought sounds like it's based more in facts than anxiety. So it's important to keep in mind that because, so when we're treating individuals with OCD, we need to help them find this sweet spot of functioning where they're able to take proper precautions, but they're not getting carried away with the precautions because that can cause other issues. So obviously some of these obsessions are very serious and we want to make sure that we know whether we're dealing with OCD or whether we're dealing with something else. Um, differential di diagnosis is always important. Um, with OCD, it's, it's especially important. Um, I would recommend that if you haven't had a lot of experience with OCD, seek out some training to see if you're interested um, in working with individuals with OCD, or you can always refer clients to individuals who have more experience. You know, one thing that, that's worth pointing out is OCD can be very tricky to diagnose and treat. And given the treatments, which we'll discuss towards the end of the webinar, we want to be 100% certain that we're dealing with OCD before we move on to treatment for OCD. So broadly, how do we tell the difference between OCD and something else? Well, if someone comes into my office and says, I'm having thoughts of drowning my infant, I want to know what's the reaction to that thought. If they tell me I'm terrified, I'm just so scared, I can't be around my daughter without someone else in the room to make sure I don't drown her, I avoid giving her baths, that's one response. Another response could be, I just feel so relieved that there's a way out. I'd still thinking about it and plan how I would do it. Right? The one on the left, that's OCD. The one on the right, that's not OCD. And so what makes that difference is the reaction to those obsessions. So in OCD, the reaction is always going to be fear. They're always going to be scared when they have those thoughts. Um, if there's some sort of relief or pleasure in those thoughts, that's not OCD and they need um, a different set of treatment for what they're going through. Um, another piece about differential diagnosis that I alluded to was delusions associated with a psychotic disorder versus OCD with poor insight. And so it really comes down to whether those thoughts are egosyntonic or egodystonic. So in delusions, the person's idea about themselves, um, uh, those delusions are consistent with the person's idea about themselves. Um, so they're kind of comfortable with these thoughts and accepting those beliefs and so see no need to question those beliefs. Um, so those beliefs, again, are consistent with them as a person. With obsessions, people typically have doubts about the content of their obsession and whether they're true. Um, and they feel uncomfortable with them, even if they're not doubting them. So even if they do have that poor insight, they feel that those obsessions are inconsistent with who they are as a person. So that makes them uncomfortable to think those things. So that's gonna be your major differentiator between delusions in a psychotic disorder versus OCD with poor insight. And um, in OCD, when individuals do have a very strong belief in those obsessions, that's called overvalued ideation. And there are scales, the overvalued ideation scale is one to be able to assess and get an idea of how strongly are they believing these, uh, these obsessions. And I'll talk later in the webinar about how we address overvalued ideation. I also wanna talk about risk, right? Because these obsessions sound pretty scary and what if they carry out those things that they're afraid of doing? Um, and this is where differential diagnosis is really important because we know for individuals with OCD, the primary risk, which is the risk associated with acting on an, an obsession, so say drowning a, um, a child, stabbing a child, suffocating a child, that risk is actually very low. You have a much greater chance of secondary risk. And so that's risk associated with performing the compulsions or the avoidance, right? So one of the compulsions I highlighted was avoidance of changing the baby's diapers. Right? You have much greater risk of, of harm from the compulsions than from what the content of those obsessions. Though with these individuals, you do also wanna be monitoring for suicidal ideation. As I mentioned, 41% of people experience comorbid depression, and it can be really challenging living with these thoughts. Um, people can have a hard time um, dealing with them, they feel like they can't speak to people about these thoughts. 
And so a lot of times they may kind of carry it in. They may think that these thoughts mean something about them as a person. And that's where you start to see that suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. I want to talk briefly about causes of OCD. Um, so similar to a lot of the disorders, we have an idea that the brain is involved. And brain imaging studies have showed differences um, in individuals diagnosed with OCD and those without. Um, in specific areas of the brain, the basal ganglia is an area that comes up consistently. But at this point, we really don't have enough information to be able to see anything conclusive or, or useful at this point. Although further supporting the role that biology plays in OCD um, is pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcal infection, um, which they very kindly abbreviated to PANDAS. And so this is an experience where children who have a severe strep throat infection experience a rapid onset in OCD symptoms, you know, in, in a few days, I'm going from no symptoms to very severe OCD. And in this condition, antibodies react, associated with the infection, react with the basal ganglia. So it does seem that the basal ganglia plays some role in this. As far as genetics, any uh, recent meta-analysis found that people with OCD are four times more likely to have a family member with OCD than a person without OCD. So this points to a genetic component, although like a lot of disorders, uh, despite considerable research, there's not been a single gene found or a collection of genes that are responsible. So uh, individual may be predisposed to OCD, but that doesn't explain the whole story. Um, chemical imbalances is, is another reason that comes up. And so it's been found that medications that influence serotonin are associated with a decrease in OCD symptoms. Um, unfortunately, we often find that discontinuing those SSRIs can lead to high relapse rates, uh, or at least relapse rates that are higher than discontinuation of behavioral therapy. So pointing to the value of a combined treatment approach. Um, and also that the chemical imbalance um, plays, a, plays a role in OCD. And then we have behavioral theories, so learned behaviors. Uh, these obsessions are unpleasant, and people find ways to temporarily, temporarily reduce their anxiety via compulsions. Right? We all I'm sure can think of examples in our own life of avoidance, right? Something makes you nervous, you avoid doing it, that feels good, you've then learned that, okay, I just need to avoid. We also have cognitive theories. Um, everyone experiences intrusive thoughts, but someone with OCD experiences a heightened sense of res responsibility and misinterpret these thoughts as being important and significant um, and that they can lead to catastrophic consequences. So. I would encourage you all to think about your own what if thoughts, right? What if I turn the wheel while I'm driving down the highway? What if I walk in front of the train? What if I blurted out an obscenity to the person at the store? You know, these are thoughts that kind of enter our mind quickly. We brush them aside as a random thought and we go about our day. And from a cognitive theory perspective with OCD is that these individuals have these thoughts, but then they assign meaning to those thoughts. Well, this must mean something about me that I had this thought, or because I had this thought that makes it more likely I do that thing. So that's something we'll come back to in treatment as well. So this graphic provides an integrative overview of the genetic and neurobiological perspective. Um, so you can see all the different factors at play. And then we'd also wanna layer on top of that the behavioral and cognitive theories, which also interact with these factors. So as you can see, the causes that lead to OCD are very complex and not completely understood. Fortunately, an understanding of the etiology of the disorder is not required for treatment. The example that I always give clients when I'm working with them is if I was an orthopedic surgeon and they broke their arm and came to me, I'm not gonna spend an hour asking questions about, well, how exactly did you fall? What were you doing? What was the angle at which your arm hit the ground? What did it sound like? What exactly did you land on? What happened in the 20 minutes afterwards? My main concern is going to be setting that arm, putting a cast on, and having them come back in three to four weeks to check in on them. And fortunately, with OCD, we don't have to have a full understanding of the etiology of the disorder, what caused it. We can move forward with treatment, and we know that individuals will get better. As far as diagnosing OCD, um, you have your diagnostic interviews, which you may recognize these. You know, these often 
um, aren't feasible in clinical settings. Um, they're typically used in research. Um, these are typically your gold standards for how do you diagnose OCD. They're based on the DSM-5, and they really go through the different criteria. Most of them will have a set of screener questions at the beginning, so that if you are going through a full diagnostic interview, you don't go through every criteria, you screen out for a lot of them. Um, you also have clinician-related instruments, so the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale and the Children's Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale are the Y box and the Psi box. These are kind of the gold standard for assessing OCD symptoms, and they're great for tracking treatment progress. Um, so these measures start out with a checklist of obsessions and compulsions. Um, and I find this to be really helpful because individuals may be hesitant to mention certain obsessions or compulsions. You know, think about the ones that I mentioned for postpartum OCD. Those aren't thoughts that people typically, um, in the first five minutes of walking into your office, say. And so it can be really helpful to just go off, a, off of a whole list of obsessions and compulsions and people letting you know which ones they experience. And it also helps to normalize the experience for them, right? So if these obsessions or compulsions are written into a measure, that must mean that other people experience it. And what we often find with OCD is people feel like they're going crazy, like they're a bad person. And we really want to be making sure that we're normalizing that this is a disorder that, that they're experiencing and other people experience this as well. You also have self-report measures. So these are typically quick screeners. They can be useful for people coming into a clinic. In my experience, I often find that people struggle with reporting on the subtlety of their OCD symptoms. Um, and so it can be helpful to uh, go through the clinician-related instruments. But again, these are, these are good for quick screeners. So now I want to talk a little bit about OCD and, and kind of what that looks like um, as far as the uh, more cognitive behavioral theory of it. And so in this graph here, you can see you have time on the x-axis, anxiety on the y-axis. And so someone's maybe going about their day, they have minimal anxiety. And what happens is they experience an obsession. When they experience that obsession, their anxiety shoots up. They then engage in a compulsion and that anxiety goes down. And so if you think back to your operant conditioning days, this is negative reinforcement. Negative because you're removing something, which is anxiety in this case. Reinforcement because it makes more likely that the behavior, the compulsion in this case, happens in the future, right? So people are learning when I have this obsession and my anxiety spikes, I need to do this compulsion to feel better. Um, and we all do this to a certain extent. And if someone went about their day and did one compulsion and that took 30 seconds, it wouldn't be a big deal, right? If I walk out of my house, I had the thought, maybe I didn't lock the door. I run back and I check, I go about my day. Uh, unfortunately, that's not what happens with individuals with OCD. Unfortunately, this happens consistently throughout the day. So their whole day looks like this seesaw of obsession, compulsion, obsession, compulsion, obsession, compulsion. So the compulsions don't work at permanently reducing the anxiety. Um, I talked about avoidance before, but it's also, I wanna highlight it here because avoidance can be just as bad as compulsions. And so you wanna make sure that you're asking what are the tasks or activities that you can engage in? Because avoidance can be just as impairing for performance um, as the compulsion. So someone may tell you, yeah, I'm, I'm not anxious at all throughout the day. But then when you ask more, you may find out that, well, they didn't change a diaper in the morning because they were afraid of touching their child inappropriately. And they left the baby in the crib for fear of dropping them. And then later in the day, they waited to feed the baby because they were just really scared they were going to poison them by accident. And then in the evening, they waited until their partner was home to give the child a bath because, again, they were afraid of touching them inappropriately. So that avoidance piece is really important to get at as well. These are the prevalence rates of OCD in the general population, so just over 1%, and then women that are pregnant and postpartum. And so you see there's a significant jump between the general population and pregnant and postpartum. And so about twice as much, twice as likely to experience OCD. And so it's really important to keep in mind that this period of time is a high risk time for OCD, other disorders as well, but OCD is certainly one of them. 
um, some information about uh, or some research about prenatal and postpartum OCD. Um, so OCD symptoms are associated with an increase in a sense of responsibility of those harm obsessions. So what that means is with greater postpartum OCD, you have greater thoughts that these harm obsessions mean something about you as a person and mean something that they need and it's something that they need to prevent, right? These thoughts are meaningful, they're important, I need to pay attention to them. Um, and in postpartum OCD, these thoughts are specific to the baby and not with non-baby obsession. So there is something specific about the child, which can make sense if you think about OCD going after something that is most important to you. Typically a child is, is going to be that for individuals. Prenatal OCD beliefs are associated with postpartum OCD symptoms. So individuals that have these beliefs um, prior to having a child may be at greater risk for experiencing those symptoms after having a child. Um, and individuals diagnosed with OCD prior to pregnancy may have worsened OCD symptoms and are at higher risk for postpartum depression. So this idea that these OCD beliefs or OC beliefs place an individual at risk following their pregnancy. It's important to keep in mind. Um, there's a, a good study by Zimbaldi and colleagues that looks at the prevalence of postpartum OCD, and um, they break out the different obsessions and compulsions that postpartum women experience. And so if we just look at the obsessions in the red box, you can see that 75%, um, over 75% of women with postpartum OCD experience aggressive obsession or contamination obsessions. 30% um, experience sexual obsessions, right? So these are pretty high rates. I think it's important to show these to normalize these experiences. These are the compulsions that they found. And again, high percentages for cleaning and washing compulsions and checking compulsions. And if you think about the highest obsessions and the highest compulsions, you can see how they match up, right? If you have obsessive obsession, aggressive obsessions, you may engage in checking compulsions. Let me check to make sure I didn't hurt the baby. Let me check to make sure that there's nothing in arm's reach that I could use to hurt the baby. If you have contamination obsessions, let me make sure I clean and wash everything, okay? What can be really challenging is that there could be a number of barriers that get in the way of mothers seeking treatment. So there may be fear of reactions from professionals, friends, or family members, right? These thoughts are really scary. They feel very abnormal, and we don't know how people will react. Um, there could be a fear of being involuntarily hospitalized or a fear of being arrested or having their baby taken away, right? If you think about the obsessions that I mentioned, if someone's not aware of OCD, this doesn't sound good, um, and they may take it the wrong way. And again, this is why differential diagnosis is very important because when we think about that primary risk piece, if, if an individual has OCD, there's minimal risk that they act on that obsession. And so they're dealing with a, a disorder rather than actual risk of harm. There can also be embarrassment. You know, shouldn't I love this child? I'm a bad mother. There's a lot of self-blame that goes on here because there's a lot of expectations about how they should feel. Now talking about treatment, so the APA Division 12, which is the Society of Clinical Psychology, lists evidence-based treatments. Um, there's two treatments with strong research support. You have exposure and response prevention and cognitive behavioral therapy, and then you have one treatment with modest research support, which is acceptance and commitment therapy. And so I'll go through each one of those. So if we take this uh, model that I mentioned before for exposure and response prevention, what we wanna do is we wanna look at, okay, what happens if we take away that compulsion? So if you put yourself in a situation that brings up that obsession and you refrain from engaging in the compulsion, now does that anxiety keep going up? Does that anxiety stay heightened forever? Or does that anxiety go down on its own? And what we find is that if you keep practicing these, that anxiety typically goes down on its own 
and the peak of that anxiety goes down. And we call that habituation. Um, the example that I always like to give with clients is if a child goes to the beach in the summer or maybe a lake and the water's cold. And so if the first time they get in the water, it feels really cold. And if they stay there, that water no longer feels cold. And that's not because their feet heated up the ocean or heated up the lake. It's because their feet got used to the temperature of that lake. Now, if that child went in the water, felt cold, ran back to warm up, went back to water, felt cold, ran back to warm up and did that for the next 20 minutes, they're never going to be able to stay in that water. Right? They have to stay there for a prolonged period of time in order to experience that habituation. It's the same thing with anxiety. So when individuals are doing exposure and response prevention, they need to stick with that anxiety for a prolonged period of time. Another piece that's important to keep in mind with exposures is that the goal is for them to learn something new. You know, I talked about when individuals are stuck in that OCD cycle, they've learned that when I'm anxious from an obsession, I need to engage in a compulsion and I feel better. And so we need them to learn something new. And what we know about learning is that it happens best when those individuals are taking the steps themselves. So those exposures are always going to be voluntary. Um, the kind of silly example I use is if someone came to my office and they were afraid of snakes and I said, perfect, I have a snake pet out back, I'm gonna throw you in, you'll be fine. Uh, they're gonna learn two things. One, that I'm a jerk and two, that they just barely survived. And they're probably never gonna come back to see me, right? Whereas if we build up and have them approach snakes in an objectively safe way and they're taking those steps, then they're gonna learn that, oh, maybe this isn't something I need to be as afraid of. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy is a, another approach um, that's very similar to exposure and response prevention. So ex, um, exposure and response prevention is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy, but in cognitive behavioral therapy, it focuses, there's a focus on the obsession. Um, so typically you're going to have that exposure and response prevention component, but we also challenge those obsessions um, because ultimately we don't want a client to believe something that isn't true. And this addresses that overvalued ideation, right? So overvalued ideation is when they believe those obsessions. So if I had a client who was afraid of uh, their child being harmed by contamination, so they won't let them crawl on the floor, well, we'd want to challenge that a little bit. Um, and we would do that by asking them some questions about, well, how many people do you know that have children that they let crawl on the floor? And of those people, how many have had a child that contracted a fatal disease from crawling on the floor? And so in order to loosen up some of these ideas um, related to the obsession, because if someone's believing that obsession 100%, it's going to be really challenging to get them to do the exposures. And the other type of treatment uh, that I mentioned with modest research support is acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, and this is a bit different than the other two. Um, with acceptance and commitment therapy, we kind of look at what's working and what's not. So attempting to control the inner experience doesn't seem to be working. You know, trying to reduce those obsessions, trying to avoid those obsessions don't work really well. Um, and so the sh we then talk about shifting from decreasing the obsessions to decreasing the compulsions. Um, and focusing on, okay, these compulsions are what's getting in the way of your life. Let's focus on decreasing those and let's just let those obsessions be there. Um, we don't necessarily have to make them go away. We don't have to engage in them. We can just let them come and go. And consistent with that, we change that interpretation of the obsession from something threatening to just another cognitive event. And we talk about values, what do you value, and what behaviors do you want to engage in? Um, now these treatments can seem, or at least acceptance commitment therapy or ACT can seem very different from uh, EXRP and CBT, but there are some common goals here. So one of the common goals is to reduce the distress associated with those obsessions. It's also to limit the compulsions and to engage in activities that are consistent with clients' values. Um, and I just want to go through a case example because I think this will be helpful to 
to talk a little bit more specifically about what those treatments would look like. So a 27-year-old female comes in experiencing obsessions that she will harm her 18-month-old daughter. Her obsessions are typically related to loss of impulse control, and she predominantly has fears of suffocating or stabbing her child. She removed all the pillows from rooms that her daughter plays in, and she removed all sharp knives from the house. She would frequently ask her husband for reassurance that she did not harm their daughter. Her husband works in a medical field and she works from home. So she's spending a lot of time at home with the child because her schedule is flexible. So in exposure and response prevention, we'd first go through psychoeducation about OCD, um, make sure that they have a good understanding of OCD and how it works. And then we work to develop an exposure hierarchy. And so that's just a, a list of exposures that we do. Again, we wanna work our way up. So maybe we'd first have her hold a pillow while a child plays across the room, and then have her hold a pillow while the child plays within arm's reach, and then hold a pillow while the child plays on her lap, and then hold a pillow while sitting in the same room as the child when the child's taking a nap, and then holding a pillow while standing over the crib while the child sleeps. Right, so there's these different factors that we can vary to make that exposure more challenging. Um, and if we think from a learning perspective, well, what is she learning as she's doing these exposures? One, she's learning that she can tolerate the anxiety. She's learning that the anxiety decreases over time, even if she doesn't engage in the compulsion. So she doesn't have to avoid things. She doesn't have to put pillows away to feel better. Um, and she doesn't all of a sudden lose her impulse control and suffocate her daughter, right? This is just a fear. It's a random thought. You know, I mentioned those what if thoughts that we all have. Um, and so this last piece about learning that she doesn't all of a sudden lose her impulse control, um, this serves to challenge those obsessions, right? So in cognitive behavioral therapy, which I'll talk about now, we really focus on the exposure response prevention piece, but also cognitive restructuring to challenge those obsessions. Um, so we could ask, how many times have you suddenly lost your impulse control in your life? How many times have you been around other people in pillows? How many times has that resulted in you suffocating someone? Are there other loss of impulse control thoughts that you have? Have you ever acted on them? And so we wanna break down that belief in those obsessions. I mean, in both cases, the end result is that the obsessions are not taken as seriously and they're not interpreted as accurate, meaningful, or saying anything about them as a person. Now, in acceptance and commitment therapy, we talk about trying to control that obsession of harming her daughter and how trying to control it, trying to reduce that anxiety, it hasn't worked very well, right? If it works, she wouldn't be in my office. And so rather than trying to reduce those obsessions, we're actually gonna focus on reducing the compulsions because that's interfering with her life, right? She's not able to do things because of those compulsions. And then we'll focus on accepting those obsessions accepting that they'll be there, but we're not gonna waste energy on making them go away, right? This is just another thought that our mind gives us. I always talk with clients about your heart pumps blood, your lungs exchange oxygen, and your mind gives you thoughts. Some of those thoughts are gonna be helpful and productive and useful, some of them are not. And we have to sift through of what's useful and what's not. And then the, um, oh, yeah, so just what I said. Um, and so those of you that are familiar with ACT know that it's an experiential-based treatment. So there's a lot of exercises you do, a lot of um, um, ex exercise you engage in, there's metaphors um, that really help tie it together. If, any, if anyone's interested in more information about ACT, um, if you go to the APA website um, in the support for ACT, there's a really good research article where they, they um, give an overview of the protocol, it can be very helpful. Um, but if we, um, in, sorry, and then the last piece is living your life according to your values. You know, so if you value family and you value being a mother, what do you then do because of those values um, as opposed to engaging in the compulsion? So if you value uh, family, maybe playing with your daughter, even if there's pillows around, rather than saying, I can't play with her because there's a pillow there. If we go back to this uh, model of OCD, just kind of a simplified way to think about how these treatments address the components of OCD. Again, this is a simplification. The exposure and response prevention really targets those compulsions most directly. Cognitive behavioral therapy addresses those obsessions most directly, although it does, um, both of them address the other as well. 
and act kind of goes around everything. You know, we're not going to engage in the obsessions. We're not going to engage in the compulsions. We're going to focus on how you want to live your life. Um, for those of you that are interested in more information about OCD, there's the International OCD Foundation. So they have a lot of good information on their website. They rain, run trainings for OCD treatment. They have resources for finding clinicians that have experience in treating OCD. And they also have an annual conference. Unfortunately, this year it's been um, adjusted due to everything that's happening, but hopefully next year they'll be back on track. There are typically local IOCDF affiliates um, that have local conferences. So I'm in New Jersey. We have the New Jersey OCD Foundation or OCD New Jersey. Um, typically in the spring, we run a conference, although this spring it was postponed to the fall. So there'll be a conference in the fall. Um, but those are great ways to get more information about OCD. And then you also have the National Institute of Mental Health. So they have a lot of good information on their website and obviously provide a lot of funding for research. Um, so I just want to Thank everyone again for taking the time out of their busy day to join me for this webinar. Um, I believe we're going to have some time for questions. Um, so while they're getting those together, I do just want to provide a little bit, bit of information about my practice and, and um, more importantly, give you my email address. So again, I work at Stress and Anxiety Services in New Jersey. We do treat a number of disorders, including OCD. Um, there's my email address. If you do have questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. And we do have two locations, one in East Brunswick and one in Florham Park. So now I'll go ahead and open this up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Fentolino. Yes, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, now we'll have um, a few minutes uh, to answer some of the questions from the audience. Okay, hold on. Let's see. All right. So. One of the first questions that came up was um, in the beginning of your talk, you were referencing um, the person who um, every time had passed by a statue and every time he had a negative thought, he would pray more often. Um, so the question is, uh, how is that different? Um, like praying religiously because of that, how is that different uh, versus the need to wash your hands due to CDC recommendations? Wouldn't they both be truths or facts to the particular person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, scrupulosity gets very, um, uh, very tricky and, and there's kind of a lot of nuance there. And so, you know, thinking about how do we differentiate what's a compulsion and what's normal uh, or typical religious engagement. And so often what we do in those situations is we will actually reach out to religious leaders in their community to get a sense of, okay, what is expected? What is typical? And so we can have that threshold of, okay, this is recommended, but these other pieces are not. And so with the individual that I was thinking about with this, you know, got to the point where um, he was really unable to function because there were so many compulsions. There was all of these obsessions and thoughts about maybe I sinned in a lot of um, what he would consider and his parents and religious leaders would consider these trivial ways. And so that's where it kind of separates out, you know, similar to the hand washing, we need to find that, that sweet spot, that gray area of, I'm not gonna tell someone to never wash their hands again, but we wanna set up what are the parameters of when does it make sense to wash your hands versus when does it fall into a compulsion? Perfect, thank you, thank you so much. Um, the other question is, can postpartum OCD turn into psychosis? That's a really good question. I honestly am not sure about that. Um, I would have to look into that. Um, when I was, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any, any indication that it can. Um, in all honesty, with postpartum OCD, it really is an under-researched area. Um, you know, my understanding is that postpartum depression receives a lot of attention, um, but a lot of the information about postpartum OCD um, it's just not as extensive. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that. I would have to look into that. Okay, thank you. Um, what is, um, so after people get treatment for OCD, do you happen to know um, the percentage of those that um, o OCD has just gone for good? And the second half of the question is, will it come back um, at another time in their life when they're going through um, a stressful situation? Yeah, good questions. And so 
you know, as far as um, whether it comes back or not, um, you know, I've I've seen a variety of outcomes. Typically, follow-ups um, show pretty good um, containment of symptoms for six months out, twelve months out. Um, you know, as uh, I've certainly worked with individuals that have gone years without having a reoccurrence of symptoms, um, but it certainly can come back. Um, you know, there are stressful life events that can. Uh, trigger it. You know, one of the things that we know, I, I mentioned about kind of this learning approach, and one of the things that we know about learning is that it can be context dependent. And so an individual may learn to manage their OCD or to not buy into those um, obsessions in one setting, but then when they're in a different setting, their mind kind of goes back to this old history that they have. You know, one of the things we know about learning is that new learning doesn't erase old learning, so you still have that old pathway. And when you go into a new situation, it can be easy to slide back into that old learned pathway of let me do a compulsion. So you certainly can see it come back. You know, when I work with individuals with OCD, um, I, we talk about relapse prevention and, and how do you know that the OCD is coming back and what do you do? And ultimately, the goal of the treatments is that the individual is learning the skills that they need and they can handle it if it comes back up. Obviously, they can always come back, but I want them to have those skills if it does start to come back. Perfect. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, in regards to medication management, um, can you go over what the typical treatment for postpartum OCD is? Yeah, well, I can at least speak to, um, to OCD in general. Um, and uh, my understanding is it's pretty similar for postpartum as well. Um, I'm my training is uh, in psychology, not psychiatry, so I can't speak definitively on the topic of medication, but typically you will see SSRIs um, in the treatment of OCD. Sometimes uh, short-term anxiolytics will be used, like benzodiazepines, and uh, typically that is at odds with the type of treatment that we would do. So any sort of treatment where we are teaching individuals that they can manage their anxiety, they don't need to make the anxiety go away instantly. Um, often those short-term anxiolytics are gonna be at odds with that. Um, so again, the most typical treatments are going to be SSRIs. SSRIs, perfect, thank you. Um, here I think is one of our last questions. Um, can you go over what is exactly going on in the brain when one experiences obsession and compulsions? Um, as far as the actual uh, physiology of what's happening in the brain, I don't know that we really have a, a good understanding of that at this point. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, it, it, there's a lot of research about kind of broad differences, but as far as that time course, that's really challenging. Uh, just the way the methods work. So with fMRI, where you're looking at blood flow, there's going to be typically a, a six to eight second lag between when someone has a thought and when that thought is actually show, shows up in the measure. Um, and so it's really challenging to get that kind of uh, time course of what exactly is happening through that obsession and compulsion cycle. Okay, perfect. And I think this might be our last, um, let's see. Okay, I have a few other questions here. Um, I am a mental health nurse working with a perinatal population. Um, I cannot, I cannot go to therapy as part of my interventions. What other interventions are helpful that are not related to therapy? Okay, so what are other interventions other than therapy that would be helpful for these individuals experiencing the OCD? Mm -hmm. You know, I would say as much as you can, um, if they're able to delay compulsions, if they're able to recognize that these compulsions aren't helpful and they're able to delay them, um, if they're able to do kind of relaxation, you know, whether that's breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, meditation, uh, strategies to try to reduce that anxiety in a way that doesn't involve compulsions. Um, you know, ultimately the goal is gonna be to reduce those compulsions because those are ultimately what's gonna be most impairing for those individuals. Perfect. And I think this is our last question. Um, have you seen a correlation between birth trauma, separation from baby after birth, et cetera, with increased OCD in the postpartum period? That's a good question. I have not seen anything about that. Um, that is interesting. I don't know. Um, you know, there may not be anything about it because there is no correlation. It just may also be something that people haven't looked at yet. So that's a really good question. 
Okay, thank you. So, um, great. Thank you for taking the time to answer those questions, Dr. Infantilino. Yeah. Um, for everyone, if you have a question that wasn't answered here, or you are in need of more resources, please use the contact information listed in the presentation, or you can contact us at the partnership at info at partnershipmch.org. Also, don't forget to visit the partnership's website to learn more about the services offered by our Perinatal Mood Disorders Initiative. A final reminder that in about an hour, you will receive an email with a link to a post-program evaluation. Your feedback is important, so please take the time to complete. Certificates of completion will be sent via the email you provided on the evaluation, so please check to make sure it is correct and should be received within one week. Lastly, a calendar of the partnership's upcoming virtual programs can be found at the uh, partnership's website, partnershipmch.org, under the Professional Educations tab. Uh, we encourage you to share today's and other webinars listed there with your social networks. And our next and final talk of this series will be next Thursday, May 28th at 1 p.m. We will have Dr. Carly Snyder, perinatal psychiatrist, facilitating her presentation entitled Mom's the Word, Signs, Symptoms, and Treatment of Perinatal Mood Disorders. Hope you can tune in and wish you all a wonderful day.